Hey, we are going to uh, go into our time of the Word, which is really exciting. And uh, we are excited for what God's going to say to us and speak to us uh, through three incredible young adults. Um, Anna, Reuben, and Owen are going to be sharing the Word uh, to us. We're going to be, all three of them are going to be speaking from the same passage. They're doing a tag team preach on one passage, which is not as easy as it sounds, I can promise you that, and they have made it look extremely easy, and I can say that with confidence, because in the first service, they were absolutely impeccable, and uh, you're in for a treat over the next few minutes. Before I invite Sarah up, Sarah's going to read the word to us today. Um, could we just pray together, if that's okay, and just prepare our hearts for all God may want to say uh, to us as a church? Father, we're so thankful um, for all that you're doing and saying. So thankful for just, just for Reuben, who's one of the amazing young people we have in this church. And we're so thankful for all you've done in the Alpha course so far and, uh, and all that you have been doing in this church as you build your church uh, in, in Exeter, in Devon, in the Southwest and beyond. And uh, as we come around your word as a church family just now, uh, we pray, Lord, that you will speak to us. We pray a blessing over um, Reuben, Anna, and Owen. And we pray, Lord, that you'll fill them with your spirit. You'll speak through them uh, into our hearts this morning. May we have real tender and open hearts to all that you want to say to us, King Jesus. So come and speak to us. Break down any walls we may have up and let us just gently and openly receive anything you want to say. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Can you give a round of applause to Sarah, who's going to come read the word out for us today? Hello. Um, I'm going to be reading Luke 5, verse 17. So if anyone wants to get their Bible up, feel free to follow me along. And it's a beautiful story of the paralyzed man. Okay. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village in Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles and into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began to think to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins? but God alone. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, today we have seen remarkable things. Bless those words. Um, and also bless what Reuben, Anna, and Owen are about to say because it's powerful. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was so good. Morning, church. Um, I'm Anna. I'm the young adults intern here. And as Sean said, we're doing a tag team sermon today and I get the pleasure of kicking us off Reuben and Owen will both be sharing shortly, and they are awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm sure most of you know this story of the paralyzed man. It's pretty iconic. And what's great about it is that there are so many different things we can learn from all the characters involved. If I had the time, I could happily ramble on for hours, but I've got six minutes, so we're going to get into it. For those of you who like to take notes, our title this morning is this, A Moment with Jesus. We chose this passage because it is such a great example of what a moment with Jesus does in our lives, the impact it has, of what it means to be a community that pursues God and pursues everything that he has for us. A lot of the time when we read this passage, we focus on the paralyzed man, and rightly so. He is the one who has his sins forgiven, his mobility restored, and it's his, and it's his story that teaches us so much about our understanding of God. But Despite all these incredible things, today I'm not talking about the man on the mat. I'm talking about the friends who carried him there. I'm talking about what it means and what it takes to be a mat carrier. First of all, mat carriers are humble and they value others above themselves. 
more and more secular culture tells us that it's about you, the individual. A me, myself, and I culture is being broadcasted to our generation where life is about what you can get rather than what you can give. Relationships are self-serving. If they don't fulfill or gratify you or if they require more of you than what you deem reasonable or fair, then people tend to withdraw or end the relationship altogether. And this isn't to say boundaries aren't important or that we're all meant to be doormats because we're not. But this inward focused lifestyle where we're only in a relationship with a person because of what we can receive isn't the model that Jesus set out for us. In Matthew 20, 26 to 28, it says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Likewise, in Philippians 2, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Church, we're meant to pick up each other's mats. If these men had only been looking to themselves or what the paralyzed man could give them, would they have picked up his mat? Because I'm not so sure. It would have been a lot more practical for them to leave the paralyzed man exactly where he was and go and see Jesus without him. I'm sure, like all of us, they had a long list of their own problems they would have loved Jesus to deal with. And as Reuben will explore in a bit, it was hardly a smooth sailing task they were undertaking. There was no way these friends could slip in under the radar and get into the back of the room with the paralyzed man. They were going to make a commotion. But they knew it wasn't about them. They knew that picking up someone else's mat means sometimes having to lay down your own interests and your own ambitions because there's something greater at work. They were willing to do everything and anything to get their friend to Jesus. Their eyes were fixed on him. In verse 18, in Luke 5, verse 18, it says, Some men were carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. These men know what Jesus is capable of. They know, as we do, that a moment with him can change everything and they're not going to settle for less. And if they're not going to settle for the outskirts of the crowd, why should we? Getting people to church is great. Bringing them along to youth or young adults is amazing and it should not be underestimated. But we're called to make Jesus followers, not churchgoers. So don't drop the mat at the top of Northern Hay or at the back row when they're sitting nice and comfortably. Take them to Jesus and expect great things to happen. Mat carriers are faith-filled Whenever I read this passage, I always come back to the same five words in verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith. Never underestimate the power of your faith in other and for other people's lives. Miracles happen because of your faithfulness. When we're in Christ, we get to partner with him in seeing him glorified. We're part of the body and we each have a role to play. But when we don't fulfill our role, when we don't pick up another person's mat, just think of the miracles the world is missing out on. Miracles of people being set free, of people who are paralyzed by fear, anxiety, whatever it is that has a control of them. We want to be part of those. I want to encourage you that if you're carrying someone else's mat right now, that Jesus sees your faith. He sees the struggle that it takes, the humility that it requires, and he honors it. Remember that you are an intrinsic part of the process, and you have no idea the impact you can have by picking up another person's mat. I could recount countless testimonies of God moving in my life, but I know without a doubt that these testimonies do not just belong to me. They belong to every person who prayed for me, cried with me, stuffed tissues into my hands because I'm an ugly crier, who picked me up when I had no strength and carried me to Jesus. 
I'm the product of great people with great faith who were willing to set aside formality and ease and carry me to the place where there is full healing, full restoration, and complete freedom in Jesus Christ. We are called as brothers and sisters to carry each other, to bear with one another, to encourage each other. People who persist in faith and pursue Jesus are the best sort of people to know, and this room is full of them. So who in your sphere is paralyzed right now? Is it you? There is no shame in waving that white flag and asking for help. We're not here to condemn or criticize you. We're here because we know what our God is capable of and we want, him to, see, we want to see him do the same thing in your life. And if you're not on the mat, then I can only encourage you to pick someone else's up. It's a heavy task to take on and you're dealing with some really precious cargo. But believe it or not, church, your mission here is so much greater than seeing Jesus move in your life alone. You're a mat carrier. Be strong and humble. Know that Jesus is capable of anything and everything and be faith-filled. Woo! Come on. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Ruben. I'm the operations intern here. I've been here for like a year and a half now. I'm the tech guy, but I use paper rather than these guys. Um, <laughs> so we pick up this story. Um, these guys must have heard Anna because they got encouraged and they decided to take this man, this friend. They decided to take him on a journey who knows how long it took them until they got to the house. But when they approached the house... There was two things in the way, and I'm going to talk about those two things. The first thing they must have seen in a distance, this house packed. Jesus was there. There was a crowd of people around him. The door must have been jammed. And the thing that I'm going to mainly focus on in this middle section of this talk is going to be the practical barriers, the things that get in the way, and I want to encourage you to get through them. But before that, before I tell you then how to do it, first of all, we need to know why. And Anna's so clearly highlighted that. But first of all, these people, this group, why did they need to go to this house? Why did they need to see this man, Jesus? And it's because they knew that in their own strength, with their own skills, with the things that they had, they couldn't do it. Sometimes we're in situations where we can't help our friends, but luckily we know someone who does, who can. And actually this is the main point I want to focus on first. That actually is, as humans, as uh, Christians, I believe our purpose, the reason that we're here on earth is to be image bearers. To know what Christ has done for us and to reflect that out to other people. But that doesn't mean that we do the work. And I'm so glad that that's the case because I know I would fail. What we need to remember is our job is to be mat carriers. That actually it's this moment with Jesus that that is the thing that changes them. We need to humble ourselves and take them on the path because he is the one that does the miracles. He is the one that changes lives, and he is the one that can do it. And what a privilege it is for us to take those people to that moment at Jesus' feet. So that's the why. These are the two things that get in the way. The first is the crowd. And who knows that people get in the way? It's quite funny. I imagine walking up to that house and just seeing these people that seem closer to Jesus. Who else has been in that situation where they go, there's other people closer to Jesus? And these people that were on the front lines were the Pharisees, the people that were all suited and booted. They regularly were fasting. They were in the temples all the time. They were the ones that looked good. They were the ones right in front of Jesus, right on the doorstep. But actually, as we found out, they were the ones that were criticizing, looking to step, to, for him to step out of line. And as we think about this, where we look around even and see there's people closer to Jesus, the people that were in the house already, the people that were in touching distance of Jesus, they were the ones that didn't know the paralyzed man. 
that I want to challenge you, each and every one of you in this room, that there are people in your path that God has placed you in, that he wants to see a miracle in their life, and that is because you are there. That if you wait for the people that maybe seem closer to Jesus, they won't pick up the mat. They might be carrying other people to Jesus, but there's people in your lives that need Jesus, and you are the one to bring them there. So hopefully now we're not as pushed off by the crowd. We actually have the identity. We're affirmed in ourselves that we know we have a purpose. We're not going to wait for the other people that are closer to Jesus. And maybe seem like they've got it all under control, but we're going to pick up that mat. We're going to take people to Jesus. Jesus looked at the ones. He doesn't want the ones that are close to him. He wants the ones that have the faith to know that the moment in front of his feet will change their life. And when they got round the crowd, they realized they couldn't go in the normal way, maybe the, the normal route, the, the way everyone else did it. That didn't put them off. That didn't send them away. Actually, they had the faith to go beyond. They climbed on the roof. And this roof here was there for a reason. Like it's normally there. It's been day to day. No one else had seen that roof as a problem. In fact, it was more of an aid, it was a comfort, it was a safety, it was a security, especially for the homeowner. Probably cost a lot as well. But actually, this is what I want to challenge you on, that actually sometimes it's those things that are our safety, that are our comfort, that are our security, that are getting in the way of us and Jesus' feet. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. I've got brief because I've not got loads of time. And three or four years of my life, from the age of like year 10 through to year 13, the kind of beginning part of that, um, I became a Christian all my life. I became a Christian when I was four, baptized at 16. Um, but I got caught up very much in the party culture. Drugs, girls, alcohol, all that kind of stuff. It very much consumed a lot of my life. But so did church. I was in church three or four times a week. If you'd have spoken to my youth leaders, they said, yeah, Ruben's a Christian. He's loving life. He loves Jesus. I go to a party on a Friday night, arrive late. Where have you been? Oh, I've been at church. You should come along. That was a lot of my story. And in January 2020, I realized when I looked at my group of friends, people that maybe seem more experienced in kind of drug culture, but also others that were even newer, I saw the conveyor belt that all of us were on. Remember times where someone had said, you try this, in six months' time you'll try this, and they were spot on. And the conversations I had with my friends saying the same. I kind of looked at this conveyor about some of my friends with dependencies and thought, wow, if I don't get off now, I don't know if I ever will. And when six months sober, three of them were in lockdown. It's kind of easy when it's in lockdown, there's not many parties. It's a bit less of a temptation. Lockdown started to ease. Two weeks, I started smoking weed again, went to some parties, did other all sorts of drugs. I remember with my girlfriend at the time, sitting down, praying and saying, you know what, God? This is going to be a lot harder than I thought. I'm going to need you. And since July 10th, 2020, I haven't touched drugs since. Thank you, Jesus. But the whole point of why I share that story with you now is that whole time I was in church. I thought I was running this race, living life for Jesus. And I look back now on these last almost two years, and I see the trajectory that God has taken me on, the things he's done in my life, the miracles he's worked in and through me, and where he's taken me. And I don't want to come off that trajectory. And I'm saying, God, show me more of those roofs, show me more of those barriers where they seem normal. It seems comforting, it seems safe, it seems secure, but it's stopping you from getting to Jesus' feet. And there's so many of those things. It could be anger. It could be the relationships. It could be unforgiveness. It could be pornography. It could be drugs, alcohol, whatever it is in your life. There's roofs in our lives that stop us from getting to Jesus' feet. You don't notice the barrier until you remove it. But when that path is clear, you can lower people and take them to Jesus' feet. So if we look at the story, these men, we need to be those people that pick up that mat. Because you're there for a purpose. Don't be put off by the crowd. 
Don't let other people, don't wait for them. Pick up that map. Clear the pathway. Break through everything that will stop you. And we leave it here where this man gets lowered at Jesus' feet. And Owen now is going to tell us why and how we know that's important. It's so great to be um, here doing this third and final part of this tag team preach. And haven't Reuben and Anna been so great in, in leading us in the story? Um, church, I love this story of the paralyzed man who was brought to the feet of Jesus and then renewed and healed. We've been looking um, through Reuben and Anna. We've been looking at the people carrying um, the, the person on the mat to Jesus. But I want to look specifically at the man on the mat. And what happens when we then have an encounter? Because church, we have all been the man on the mat. We've all been that person paralyzed by our sin, paralyzed by the world, paralyzed by our thoughts, but being transformed and renewed by Jesus. And it's such a beautiful thing, knowing that when we bring our life, when we bring our story, when we bring ourselves, our mat, to the feet of Jesus, our lives are changed forever. But I think so often when being the man with the mat, we follow this storyline. But when it comes to when Jesus commissions us to go, we freeze. We stop. We get too comfortable and content knowing that we are saved, knowing we have a relationship, knowing we're okay, we have the salvation. But what about those people that don't? What about those friends you have that don't know Jesus? What about the woman you always see for coffee? The people even in church. What about these people that don't have a genuine connection with Jesus? The people we do life with, the people we're surrounded by. What about these people? And I want to give you a scary statistic. It says um, 33% of the world's population class themselves as Christian. Did you hear that? That leaves 67% of people on earth, people living right now, the people that live around us, the people we do life with, without a relationship with the almighty, loving, beautiful Father we have. And this church, this church, honestly, this breaks my heart. And I hope it breaks yours too. Knowing that there are people out there living without Jesus, not having a solid rock, not having that. Well, I want to look at how we can then be a part of bringing as many people to Jesus as possible. When we look at Luke 5, we see this beautiful story, like I said, of Jesus transforming this once paralyzed man. But then we see Jesus commission this man after his encounter. Jesus says to the man during his experience, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And in the scriptures, it follow, um, follows after um, by saying immediately he stood up, took what he had been lying on, and went home. So when Jesus told him to go, what does that mean? And then how are we able to apply that to our lives, to your life? Well, Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, gives us a perfect example of how to go. He says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And this passage for me, this passage of scripture clearly indicates that we have a duty other than making and building a relationship with Jesus. We have a duty to go and evangelize. Go and bring those people to Jesus. Suddenly we need to be the mat carriers now. And we need to be those people carrying those mats those people to Jesus. And you may be sat there saying, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism or, or I'm not confident enough to evangelize. Well, you're wrong. And I'm going to quickly break down evangelism for you. Number one is a message. And number two, a method. The message never changes. The message is the gospel. The message is the good news. The message is what gives us life. It's Jesus coming down to earth and saving us. That is the message. 
But the method, on the other hand, that's where we get to play. That's where we get to be creative. That's where we get to, to let Jesus spark ideas in our mind about how to bring this message across. So it's message and method. And the best part about it is it's not a right or wrong way. As long as you're getting that message right, the method can be anything you want to be. So when we have our lives changed by Jesus, we can't just be complacent anymore because there's a greater call, a call for us to go. And I just want to quick, quickly share a little bit of my testimony over the lockdown. Um, obviously, very obviously, we were in lockdown. We couldn't see people. There was social distancing. And in my head, evangelism was just talking to people about Jesus. And, and it is, obviously. But um, I was trying to work out and find a different way, a way where I could connect people, the way, a way I could reach people and talk to people about Jesus. And I started posting things on my social media. And I saw thousands and thousands of people through the different preachers, the Q&As, the different interactions, encounter Jesus through what I was doing on social media. And it was such a beautiful thing to see those who were Christian, but those who weren't Christian, those who had relationships with Jesus go up and down because of the lockdown, interact with this. I had comments like, this is the first time anyone's ever prayed for me. I had comments like, I don't know how I ended up here. I don't know how I'm watching this or why I'm watching this. And it was so amazing to see Jesus work in such a place of uncertainty, in a place where I feel like we couldn't evangelize anymore. And you may not know where to start though. And a lot of people don't. So I want to encourage you friends today in three different areas to help you in your disciple making journey. Number one, you have to earn the respect for someone to listen to you. That means building relationships. That means being empathetic. That means asking questions to people. Learn about them and then let them observe you and how and why you are different. Number two, God made you for a reason. Do you hear that? God made you for a reason. You have specific characteristics. You have specific qualities and gifts that Jesus has placed on your life specifically that you can use to reach people. How great is that? Don't make Jesus, don't make talking about Jesus a chore. And finally, ask the Holy Spirit for opportunities. The Holy Spirit is our greatest tool when it comes to reaching people when it comes to bringing people to Jesus. And then when we do that, we have to be ready to spot the opportunities the Holy Spirit is placed in front of us. I'm going to finish by, by just praying. Um, yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that me, Anna and Ruben have, have had today and, and for all the young adults and the youth and the students and I pray right now, Lord Jesus, you would soften our hearts to understand there's a greater call for us, a call to make heaven crowded. Who wants, who wants, who wants to see heaven crowded? Yeah, Lord, we just thank you so much that you've placed scripture in our life so we can look at, so we can understand, and so we can follow. I want to pray right now for those maybe carrying a mat or those um, wanting to carry mats. And I pray right now, Lord, you would just spark opportunities, spark ways for them to, to, you know, be different, to carry those mats. Lord, I pray for the barriers that get in the way of that as well. Lord, I pray right now that they would see minuscule in comparison to who you are and what you can do, Lord Jesus. And finally, Lord, I want to pray for just a soften, softening of our hearts to know that we are called to do more than just life with you. We're called to bring life to other people. And I thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for who you are and the fact you help us along this journey. And I want to pray in your holy and heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Well done. Well done, guys. So proud. Well done. Anyone else had a moment with Jesus that's changed everything in their lives, hey? Just one moment with Jesus, that's all it takes. 
for lives to be transformed, for testimonies to be created, for situations to turn around. One moment with Jesus. We're going to worship in a minute. We're going to play a song before um, our senior leader, Mark, is going to close the service just after uh, this last song of worship. Let me tell you something about Owen there that's just sharing at the end. And everyone that's been involved today, you've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you, young adults and youth, for leading us this morning. We're so thankful for you. Um, Owen uh, in lockdown was speaking about his social media that he uses and he's got a variety of different social media but some of you that might have been listening in that moment might be thinking well you know everyone tries to use their social media uh, Owen's a little bit different um, during lockdown he started doing uh, something called TikTok anyone heard of TikTok in the room yeah so TikTok's an app that's used it was made for short little videos to be created and effectively when you're on the app you just scroll in through short little 30 second videos and Owen started to create this TikTok and during lockdown he started to basically preach and pray for people on TikTok. How cool is that, hey? That he just started to use this platform to try and get this message. He realized the method was TikTok. Then he could preach to a generation, pray to a generation. Um, he's got thousands and thousands of followers on his TikTok now. He does Q&A live streams once or twice a week. And every time he goes live, he has hundreds of young people tuning in and asking questions solely about faith. Not... Not only that, um, I, I realized I was a little bit outdated as a youth pastor and thought I should download this TikTok thing when I joined the team, right? The young people are laughing at me now because they know that I don't know really much about TikTok at all. So I downloaded TikTok and I started going through it. Most people use it and some of the guys in the youth, they, they use it for like dances and all kinds of different things and there's uh, videos, there's like all, all kinds of things on there and you scroll through and you're just having a look and when I first downloaded this, this app, I just started going through and it's trying to figure out my algorithms, seeing what I'm like, kind of watch, what I don't watch and all this kind of stuff I was going through. This video is about football and people doing these dances and stuff. And I was feeling like a really old man at this point as I was scrolling through. And lo and behold, it was about 10 p.m. at night. And I was just trying to get to grips with this app that I know young people are on. And I was scrolling a video on football, scrolling people dancing, scrolling video of football, scrolling people dancing, scrolling, stop. And there right in front of me in my eyes was this man Owen. And here's what he did. He just went like this. This is the video. Stop what you're doing just for a moment. I want to pray for you. And he started praying for me. Hundreds of young people are going through this app and there's people turning up and praying for them every single day. That's what it looks like to carry our mats. That's what it looks like to take a message and use a method. That's what it looks like to have one moment with Jesus and allow it to change our lives. There's so many of us in here, we've had a moment with Jesus. But what does it mean for us right now? What does it mean for us going out today? How can we use the message and the method? How can we bring people towards Jesus? We've got a great opportunity on Wednesday to take what we've heard today and not just be hearers of the word, but to be what? Doers of the word. How do we do it? We take the message, we take the method, and we take it to our friends. We say, hey, there's a great opportunity this Wednesday. Come along to Alpha. Come hear this comedian that was on Britain's Got Talent. Come hear the good news of the gospel. Take this course of us. And hopefully you'll experience what? One moment with Jesus, because that's all it takes. Would you stand with me, church, as we sing this song? And just posture your heart in any way. If you're comfortable with it, you can lift up your hands, you can close your eyes, you can do whatever you want, but just want to settle your heart for a moment. Don't let this just be a moment where we just hear something that encourages and inspires us, but let this be a moment where we do business, where we say, God, I want, I want something to change. I want to take this, and I want to become a doer of your word. I want to know the message again in my heart. I want it to transform my life. And then I want to cre think creatively of methods I can take this to the world. So King Jesus, together as one, in this room this morning, together as a church family, different stories, different backgrounds, ages, all those kind of things. We all are united because we've had one moment with you. We've had one moment with you that's changed our life. So we pray in this space, in this time, as we sing this song, will your presence come and will it come and invade our hearts and our minds? We ask, Lord, that you will walk through this room and you will speak to us, challenge us, prompt us to do something with what we've heard today. And may your kingdom come in this place as it is in heaven. Come and invade this room, we pray. We pray in your powerful name. Amen.